In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, just noticing with the reading and the music, we are coming to the end of Youth Month in our Archdiocese. And as we've been doing for the past um, few weeks here of October, uh, we've had the youth singing is required, the youth doing the readings, and of course other things that they've been assisting with in our liturgy. So if you're coming and looking and saying, well, what's going on? That's what's going on. So uh, next week, uh, we kind of go back to what we typically do. So we have that to look forward to. Uh -oh. There is within basically priestly formation, there is a question about touch and touching people. I want to talk about that uh, to a great extent in my homily. And of course, there is of course, you can read in the news inappropriate forms, but there are appropriate forms as well. And just to give you something, uh, something to keep in mind here, you know, I went to seminary in Boston in the mid 2000s, and so this is in the wake of all of the scandal the Catholic Church had in the Archdiocese of Boston and lawsuits and all of that, and that reverberated through the whole area and not just the Catholic Church. So the basic advice, direction, and formation that I was given in seminary was uh, something along the lines of don't touch your parishioners because it could be misconstrued. Don't be the huggy priest because it can be misconstrued. Now there is an appropriate way of touching people. And that really is the core of what this homily is about. And there are a number of pieces to look at here. Of course, in our gospel reading, we hear this reading every fall, and it usually does land at about this time, end of October, beginning of November. It's where it actually picks up on what we heard last week. Jesus went to the, uh, the, the land of the gatherings, casted demons out of this man, and then returned back to Capernaum. If you're reading in the Gospel of Luke, he's basically getting off the boat from them where we begin our reading today. And so, there's a crowd waiting for him. Oh, you've come back. And these are faithful Jews that have been following him over time. And one of the first people that steps forward is the head of the synagogue in Capernaum, Jairus. He says, my daughter is dying. Come to my house and heal her. And so that sets the mission that Jesus has. And what's unique about this gospel story is they have two pieces to it. So one is the overarching piece where he does go to Jairus' house and raises his daughter, who has died. But in the process of walking through the crowd, and that's really the core of what we'll look at today, is this woman who steps forward, who needs healing. little aside here. In a little bit here, after the homily... Of course, we begin and move to the second half of the Divine Liturgy. The big feature is the, the great entrance. You know, the servers line up, the practice of our parishes, the children line up with icons, and then we do a procession and come up to the front here. And often in that procession, when I walk by people, they will come over and touch the edge of my garment. It's a pious custom. It's a touch. It comes from this story. It's in that sense of that woman who needed healing and said to herself, if I touch the hem of Jesus' garment, I will be healed. I think that those of you who do that, there is the sense of, I can connect with Jesus in this great entrance and in this liturgy, my cares and concerns being brought to the altar by touching the hem of the priest's garment. And that's why people do that. And there's something to that. Otherwise, I, I would be chastising you. No, that's inappropriate. Don't touch the hem of my garment. I'm, you know, I'm trying to do things here. But it's a well-established custom within the Orthodox Church. As I said, it comes from this story. What were the circumstances that woman had 
We hear that she had an issue of blood or a hemorrhage for 12 years. And she had spent all of her money and livelihood on healers and doctors trying to get treated for this condition to no avail. And if you think of the circumstances, first century, Palestine, the Jewish community, the Mosaic law said if you had any sort of injury or wound or blood at all, you were considered unclean. And you couldn't be around other people. So imagine this woman, outside of community for 12 years, wanting to be within community for 12 years. And she does this very bold thing. She gets this thought. I know Jesus is a healer. If I just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed by doing that. And so she does this very audacious thing based on that. She's unclean. She's not supposed to be around people. She walks into a crowd. Not only does she walk into a crowd, but the focal point of the crowd is Jesus walking with the ruler of the synagogue. Important people. And so by walking up to them, essentially according to the law, she renders them unclean. They're supposed to separate from the community and purify themselves because they came in touch with blood and all of that sort of stuff. When she touches Jesus' garment. And of course her intention was just I know if I touch the garment, I'll be healed, and I can just kind of fade in the background, and nobody will be the wiser. But Jesus stops, and he says, who touched me? Of course, Peter's there, and he's like, you're in a crowd. Everybody's touching me. What do you mean? And he said, somebody touched me, and I felt power go out from me. Keep in mind that he's God incarnate. He knew exactly what happened. He knew who touched him. But he made that point of calling it out. It's not because the woman was in trouble for touching him, and it's not that he was trying to publicly embarrass her for touching him. But it was to make sure that everyone knew and understood what had happened. So the woman could say, here are my circumstances, this is my problem, I said if I touch his hand, I'll be healed. And Jesus' response to the woman is, Go! Your faith has made you well. And then we continue on our the story. Well, in preparing for this homily, I came across uh, an interesting piece of writing. Um, some of you may have heard of uh, St. Nikolai of Zisha. It's a Serbian saint. 20th century saint. Uh, he was not just in Serbia, but he was also here in North America. And there, there are some churches that are found um, who he's the patron. Um, St. Nicholas in Billings, Montana. Have you ever been to Billings, Montana? Uh, where my wife is for me. I do that one plug there. But the writing that St. Nikolai did touches on this particular story, no pun intended. The title of it was The Mystery of Touch. And it points at this idea of appropriate touch within the Orthodox Church. The gist of that piece is really looking at ordination. And it's kind of answering this question. Why, when we ordain people to be deacons, priests, and bishops, does a bishop put their hand on that person's head? I don't know if you've been in an ordination service, but at the ordinate part of the ordination, uh, the candidate processes around the altar three times. And it's interesting. Three hymns are sung. The same three hymns that are sung at the marriage service when they're going around the table. So in a sense, being wedded to the church. And then after the third procession around, the candidate stands in front of the altar. The bishop is next to him. And the candidate kneels. And the bishop puts his hand on the candidate's head. And basically invokes the Holy Spirit. 
It says perfect that which is imperfect, to do the job of whatever order they're being ordained to, deacon, priest. <laughs> And St. Nikolai parses that out. He says, that comes from the beginning. When we look at the Feast of Pentecost. Jesus Christ has ascended into heaven. He's told the apostles to wait in Jerusalem in the upper room. Because they'll send someone. The Comforter, the Holy Spirit. And so the beginning, and how we talk about Pentecost, is the beginning of the church. Is the Holy Spirit descending upon the apostles and touching them? Power has been infused into the apostles by the Holy Spirit at that event. And so the service of ordination is continuing that. The grace that went into the apostles, the Holy Spirit, when they ordained people and put their hands on other people, that grace was continued. The language that's used is that it's a river that flows. And so when we talk about the life of the church through the ages, it's the continuing of this river through time, flowing and flowing. And the Holy Spirit working through that flow that is the church. So in terms of touch, and appropriate touch, there is that thing that you do where you come and touch the hem of the garment, and that expresses of a hope. But in terms of what you have access to, the grace is through the mysteries offered by the church. And so the one that we'll be doing here in a little bit here is communion and the divine liturgy. And I say every Sunday when I do this. Send down thy Holy Spirit upon us, and these gifts here spread forth. That's the power that comes in. Bread and wine. I say that it's a miracle every Sunday. Bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ that we partake of. That's a familiarity that we have. And that is us plugging into this grace. But think of the other mysteries of the church. They all involve touch. And that's the appropriate time for the priest to touch you. There are actually notes in the service book, you know, priest puts his hand on your head. The priest makes the sign of the cross on this part of your body. That sort of thing. So, of course, we have baptism and chrismation. For the record, probably the parishioners who are most angry with me ever are babies at baptism. <laughs> because they get handled. They're touched. Think about it. They come to church Usually mom's done a really good job of comforting them and quieting them, and they're taking a nap. And then they hand that poor child to me. And I'm touching this child, and I'm doing things. They get anointed with oil. Then they get dunked into water three times. And I try to make sure the water's warm, but sometimes that font sits there a little bit. And it's a little shocking for that child. This is cold water, and I'm going all the way under and when they come out, everyone's putting clothes on them. And then there's this whole thing of the chrismation, where they're anointed with oil on all these different parts of their body. But it's so important because that takes them from being just someone and grafts them into the body of the church. And the chrismation gives them the power of the Holy Spirit. And we say that. Babies are full members of the church after they've been baptized and chrismated. We don't do this thing like, okay, well, you know, a couple of years you do a first communion, and then okay, in a couple of years you go and you have a confirmation, and kids are the future of the church, and all of that language. Members of the church, just like the people who are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. You grow into a role, but you're a full member. And we see that elsewhere, too. All of these things that we have. You come to confession. And how we do it here. The person confessing stands face the icon of Christ. I stand to their left. They tell me what their sins are. I offer counsel. And then as we're finishing, I take the end of my epitrahelion. And I put it on their head. And I say prayers. 
And I finish by making a sign of a cross, touching their head. Holy Spirit, working through that act. We don't always come for confession. And I know I've talked about that. There's also unction, the anointing for healing. Kind of the typical thing in a parish is, oh, it's Wednesday of Holy Week, I'll go for the, the unction service, and I'll be anointed. And we don't think anything further than that. A frustration I have as a priest is how many times I hear about people who've gone to the hospital and come home after the fact. There's unction. Why are you not partaking of that, where I anoint you? It's a big thing for the shut-ins when I go and visit them. I put my hand on this, a little different from the service. I put my hand on their head, and I say that prayer. And I have the oil on my thumb. I don't do like a little Q-tip or a laundry. The oil's on my thumb, and I mark on their forehead for the healing of soul and body. Grace of the Holy Spirit. It's in there. I can go through weddings as well. You're two individuals. You come for a wedding. I join your hands. Those rings, they're touched to your head by me. You have the crowns that are put on your head by me. Grace of the Holy Spirit. Two individuals come, and then one thing. A marriage leaves. Something new and different. And so these are all things that we have access to. We avail ourselves of communion. But I want to highlight as I've gone through this. If you're not baptized or chrismated, I had this conversation with someone this week, an inquirer, talking about all of their concerns, their sins, and things that they were worried about. And I basically said, I can talk to you about this. And you can read all of the Orthodox books about this. But in terms of making any sort of progress, you can't do that outside of the church. I can't hear your confession. You can't be fed and receive communion. You cannot have unction to heal you when you're sick. So I'll keep meeting with you and I'll keep talking with you, but just know it's a conversation and something to ponder. Don't stand at the door looking in the window. Come into the house and receive the Holy Spirit and the grace that's available to you. If you are sick or if you know that you are going to go to a hospital, avail yourself of unction. If you are struggling with some sort of sin or difficulty in your life, don't wait and try and weigh it out for yourself. Come for confession. And of course, do the good thing that you have been doing and keep doing that. Come for the divine liturgy. Be fed through the communion. And of course, like the woman with the issue of blood, you can touch the hem of my mouth and know that the church is here to help heal you. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to Christ.